In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Lord God Almighty, we come before you once again this day. We come ever grateful for giving us the gift of life, for the gift of sharing uh, in your life. We give you thanks uh, for uh, the Mass that we just celebrated and how you uh, nourish us uh, with food for the journey. Uh, we give you thanks for the chance to gather in your name and to uh, find encouragement in one another. Please bless our time together. Uh, open up our hearts to hear whatever it is that uh, you desire to, to say to us today. Again, we continue to ask for your blessings upon those that we know and love who are carrying extra heavy crosses these days that you would be with them, that you would heal them if it be your will, that you would bring them great strength. We ask all of this uh, humbly uh, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So uh, a man was brought into uh, a hospital, <laughs> Mercy Hospital, and uh, went in for emergency uh, coronary surgery. And the operation goes better than expected, and uh, afterwards he, he comes out of surgery. He's a little groggy, and one of the nuns uh, comes up and gives him an awful lot of comfort and, and tells him that things went well and he should be okay. And uh, she comes back a little bit later, and she says, you know, Mr. Smith, uh, we are going to have to work through how, how we're going to make a payment for this surgery. Uh, do you have insurance? And he says, uh, I'm sorry, sister, I don't have any insurance. And, sh and he, she says, well, I mean, do you have cash to pay for this? And he says, no, sister, I don't have any uh, cash to pay for it. And he says, well, do you have any relatives or anybody that could help out with this? And he says, the only relative I have is a, a spinster nun out in Chicago. And the nun gets a little bit upset and says, um, you know, Mr. Smith, uh, nuns are, are not spinsters. They're married to God. And he said with a smile, well, then why don't you bill my brother-in-law? <laughs> so uh, I have uh, uh, given the title to my reflection today, the, the Royal Priesthood of the Laity. And I think that it's... Uh, something that we've probably heard, and I'm not sure how much we all necessarily embrace um, as, as lay people in particular, but um, the church understands that every human being is called by God. Every human being has a vocation, a call from God. Um, and now, I, that call, I, I think, kind of is understood to have kind of two dimensions. The first is that everyone is called in a bit of a similar and foundational way. Uh, and that is first to follow Christ and to joyfully bring his light and his love into the world. Every one of us has that foundational call. But secondly, we are called to a, a lifelong way of serving uh, God and building his kingdom that is particular to each of us. And so we are either called to kind of be single and married. I think most are called to be married or we're called to be priest or consecrated. And uh, I, I think that for way too long in, in the recent history of the church, people have understood that only priests and consecrated have a vocation. And that is not true. Every one of us has been called specifically and personally by God to carry out a project in this world that only we can do. And it's not just my life to kind of go out there and do what I want with, but that my life has been given to me by God and he's got a plan that he wants to work out with us 
in conjunction with us, but he has a plan, a call. And today I want to speak about uh, an element in particular of uh, the lay vocation. In essence, your all vocation. Um, that might be a little bit unfamiliar to some of you. And so you as lay people um, have an important share in the priesthood of Jesus Christ. The royal priesthood of Jesus Christ. St. Peter in his first letter uh, proclaims, and this was not to the apostles, this was to the, the, the people in general. But you are a chosen race called, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own, so that you may announce the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Through baptism, every Christian participates in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly office of Jesus Christ. Everyone does. And during the rite of baptism, the minister, usually right, a, a deacon, a, a priest, or a bishop, anoints the newly baptized with holy chrism, which is the same chrism that is used at confirmation and the same chrism that is used in the sacrament, actually, of the priesthood. Uh, and uh, he says... God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, has freed you from sin, given you a new birth by water and the Holy Spirit, and welcomed you into his holy people. These are all some of the great effects of baptism. He now anoints you with the chrism of salvation, as Christ was anointed priest, prophet, and king. So may you live always as a member of his body, sharing everlasting life. We share, you share, every baptized person shares in this priesthood of Christ. The Catechism of the Church says, Christ, high priest and unique mediator, has made the Church's kingdom priests for his God and Father. The whole community of believers is as such priestly. Now, it is true that the ministerial or the hierarchical priesthood of bishops and priests uh, in the, has uh, a share in the priesthood of Christ that the church would say is essentially different. It is true. Priests and bishops have an essentially different share in the priesthood of Christ, but nonetheless, every baptized person shares in the priesthood. So, how do the laity share in the priesthood of Christ? Well, you know, the truth be told that the first one is prayer. All right, we, we expect that priests of any religion and of any faith, right, would be people of prayer. Well, you are expected to be people of prayer. First and foremost, for your own personal journey to Christ. It's, you know... Pretty simple, but uh, you are called to be men and women of deep prayer, to remain close to Christ, to be united with Him as someone He loves and cherishes, to draw, I, I like this phrase, to draw waters from the springs of salvation, to find refuge and strength and wisdom and joy from being in relation with God. To learn at his feet as the master. So the first reason for prayer is for your own personal journey with God. But secondly, for your role as intercessors in this world. For your role to be praying for this world. Do you think that only, again, priests and, and consecrated are supposed to be the ones praying for this world? That we're the only ones that have prayers that are worthy of being offered up to God for your family and for your neighbors and for your friends and for your co-workers? 
James 5, 16 states, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous man has great power in its effects. Our Lord himself tells that great story of the unjust judge and the persistent widow where she just keeps going to him and she keeps going to him and she keeps going to him. And even though this judge uh, has no respect for God or for human beings, in the end he gives her what he wants, what she wants. And in the end, uh, the Lord says, Will not God then secure the rights of his chosen ones who call out to him night and day? Will he be slow to answer them? So there are people in your life who need your prayers and your loving intercession. Secondly, um, offering sacrifice. That's what we think of priests doing, right? Certainly in the Old Testament, but really even in the New, with the sacrifice of the Mass. And St. Peter, in a verse just before the one that I quoted, said, Come to him, a living stone, rejected by human beings, but chosen and precious in the sight of God, and like living stones, you, 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 living stones, let yourselves be built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So one very important place to render this service to God and neighbor is at the Mass. And it's at the offertory time in the Mass. And the principal sacrifice of the Mass, I, I think we all know this, right? The principal sacrifice of the Mass is the complete and total giving of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, to the Father, surrendering His will, human and divine, to the Father on the cross in this act of love that He surrenders for the redemption of the world and the forgiveness of every one of our sins. That is the principal sacrifice of the Mass. And that one sacrifice that took place nearly 2,000 years ago is made present to us in a mystical, mysterious, yet real way on that altar. And you as lay people are invited to join the sacrifices of your lives with that sacrifice at the Mass. And for the most part, it's, it's the struggles, right? It's, it's the sickness of someone that we love. It's the loss of someone that we love. It's trials at work. It's trials in the family. It's, it's whatever. Um, the sacrifices of our lives, we are invited to unite them. But they can also be sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving. A sacrifice of thanksgiving, I think, is one of the most pleasing sacrifices that we can give to God. And these are meant to be united during the offertory. When the gifts are being brought forward at Mass, this is part of what's supposed to be going on at Mass. And so um, everyone is called to, during the Mass, to participate in Jesus' sacrifice. Um, then God transforms these sacrifices when they're united with Christ and makes them redemptive so that God can use your sacrifices to bring about His redemptive work in this world. There's a line that I'm not sure we pay enough attention to during the Mass, and this one does get said publicly. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to Almighty God. Thirdly, um, the proclamation of the wonders of God. I, I think in general we expect priests are supposed to proclaim good things about God. Again, as uh, that I've already quoted, so that you may announce the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Part of the role of this priest is, is to speak the word of God to the world 
That is part of your role too. One of the most effective ways uh, uh, to speak a word of God to the world is to proclaim His wonders. And we all need to learn the art of observing God's wonders. Our eyes need to be open to the great things that God is doing in this world. We need to be looking for those great things. We need to have eyes who see God working in this world. And then we need to share that good news with others. Not in an obnoxious way, not standing up on a soapbox and, and yelling and screaming, but just in simple conversations, in, in an email, in a text, in, in just the way in which we, 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 we see God and, and, and mention Him briefly, quickly to other people. You are called to proclaim God in this world too. It's not just the role of the priest. At our annual retreat for youth apostles uh, in January, we, we just had it. Um, this is going to sound a little scary to you, but it, it starts Wednesday and goes through Sunday. So it's a long retreat. I, I went, we had 33 talks and homilies. It's a lot, okay? Only eight were given by our priests. Our laymen. We're up there speaking the word of God to our brothers in some of the most beautiful and powerful ways. In fact, I think if, <laughs> I, I think if you ask the brothers to be honest, I think probably the best talks were given by our lay brothers. You are called to bring God into the world and to speak of Him and His wonders. Final word. Um, this is uh, an image that I like a whole lot that was given to us by Vatican II. Um, in, a, in one of its most important documents, Lumen Gentium, which was on the church, um, it used uh, the image of leaven. They are called, meaning the lay people, in the section on the laity, that they are called by God, being led by the spirit of the gospel, that they may contribute to the sanctification of the world, as from within like leaven, by fulfilling their own particular duties. And so, my brothers and sisters, as lay people, you go into the world and you go to places that priests and consecrated don't go. I mean, we may go on occasion, but that's not our world. You go into the world where you work, where you live, where you play, where you hang out. You go into that world, and in a certain sense, only you can bring God into those places. And that's your vocation as a lay person, is to bring God into those places. How often do we kind of feel like, well, the church is just not present in the field of education, in business, in entertainment, in politics, in science, in medicine, in athletics, in law. How often do we feel like the church just isn't present there? That's your job. That's your job, is to bring God into those places. Our job, generally, as priests and consecrated, is to bring God to you. And your job is to bring God into the world. Now, not always, and there, there's, there's crossover, right? But in general. Bread cannot rise without leaven. The kingdom of God cannot be built up without your assistance, my brothers and sisters. God needs you. The church needs you. The world needs you. 
But I invite you to go with courage and great hope, remembering the words of St. Paul, I can do all things with Christ who strengthens me. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you all very much.